Table 1 of ANSIO 5.1 shows all of the designated fiber strengths for all of the species that are manufactured into wood poles. You'll notice there are four groups and they have to do with the different conditioning that occurs before the poles are treated. Group A air seasoning is just what it says. It dries in the air whereas kill drying speeds up the process. The two in the middle, B and C, are processes that are used to heat up the pole and then withdraw the moisture from it. And that's the main intention of all of these, is to dry the pole. Now you see the fact these are the three main species that are used mostly across the country. They probably represent 80% or more of all the poles. Southern yellow pine is 8,000 psi, Douglas fir 8,000, and western red cedar 6,000. And most of the attention and the work we do on the committee is on these three main species. When you look at the map of the U.S., there's pretty much a divide right down the continental divide there in the Rockies. East of the Rockies, just about all distribution poles are southern yellow pine. Certainly not all. There are variations, but vast majority. Transmission, then, are Douglas fir, cedar, and southern pine. Not a lot of southern pine poles grow to the length that's required and the girth that's required for transmission. So the utilities in the southeast where most of the southern pine grow have probably the best access to the southern pine poles that are used in transmission. Otherwise, dug fir and cedar are brought from the west coast. Looking on the west side of the U.S., distribution is almost all Douglas fir poles. Transmission, again, is Douglas fir and western red cedar. So we have some differences because of the differences in these species. When we look at southern pine, it's considered a thick sapwood species. You can see the light brown is pretty deep in a pole, and treatment can penetrate through the sapwood. It cannot penetrate into the darker center of the pole, which is the heartwood. Since southern pine poles tend to decay on the outside, this high level of treatment in the sapwood is very effective at resisting decay. Now when we look at the western species, as you see in this cross-section view, very thin sapwood, so the treatment can only penetrate an inch or so to the outside. The heartwood is not treated. The way decay occurs typically in the western species is the check that you see here in the cross-section is open to a certain level during treatment, and so the inside of that check is treated. As the pole dries in service, the check expands, like you see there, and exposes wood that was not originally treated, and so decay tends to begin on the inside of either Douglas fir or western red cedar. Table 1 also has a range of footnotes, which we're going to highlight a couple of. Number one is the effects of conditioning on fiber strength have been accounted for in the table. This is the conditioning we talked about before where the table has t four different categories of different types of conditioning. And so these net fiber strengths are already accounting for the conditioning. And number four was added just a couple revisions ago to clarify that the designated fiber strength, and this applies only to the three main species of pine, fir, and cedar, but that it represents a mean ground line fiber strength value with a coefficient variation equal to 20%. And that's where I was using those numbers before when we looked at that bell curve. Now you remember I mentioned a thin sapwood species on the west coast and that treatment can only penetrate a short distance into the pole. So a process had been developed over the years to improve the treatment in Douglas fir poles. And there were templates like this that were used to bore holes all the way through the pole in the ground line zone. After some early trials, this process was shown to be very effective at improving the resistance to decay in the ground line zone. But there was no standardized procedure. Utilities would use different size borings and different spacing, so they asked the ASC05 committee to come up with a standard 
pattern. The first thing we had to do was figure out does the through boring impact the strength on the pole? And this testing was conducted at Oregon State, a very sophisticated test stand. You can see as it applies load, it's just like the wind blowing on the wires at the top of the pole. And this is a classic failure mode. If you look by the hands of the person on the other side of the pole, compression, the wood is starting to buckle outward. And on the bottom side, you can see the tension tears, which is a very typical pattern for wood poles to fail in. After all the testing, it was determined to create a pattern like you see here, and that was adopted into the 2015 ANSIO 5.1. The hole diameter was standardized on a half inch. You'll notice some of the borings in that right-hand image are slanted downward in case water enters the pole and will run out the pole. And on the pole next to that, that generally the pattern goes up two feet above ground and three feet below ground. What's critical is the cross section that we see up above section A there. You'll notice in cross section A there's a two inch zone where no holes are Board. That's to preserve that outer shell that provides a majority of the bending capacity for a pole. Now if the wires run north and south, just like this, as you see in this cross section, that two inches of shell is still effective and technically there's no reduction in the pole bending strength. However, if the wires run east and west, for example, and the pole happened to be installed improperly, like you see here, then there is a 5% impact on the remaining strength of that pole. And that has to be accounted for. So there's a new footnote that's been added to the code, footnote 5, which says, where Douglas fir are through board prior to treatment to account for that process, the designated fire stress shall be reduced by 5%. So instead of 8,000, it uses 7,600. Now on the West Coast, through boring is a pretty popular process, uh, but this is a new requirement just because you can't be certain of how the pole is going to be installed. Another characteristic of wood poles that was added to the 2017 Table 1 was the modulus of elasticity. You can see the values that appear here. It's addressing the stiffness so that for a given amount of load on the pole, how much do you expect the tip to deflect? There were also some changes in the footnotes. The previous footnote 1 only addressed fiber strength and the fact that the effects of conditioning were already considered in those values. Now MOE has been added to that as well. Then there's an additional footnote 7 which really explains that the modulus of elasticity represents a mean value. Once again very similar to the fiber strength. So we've addressed the horizontal load and the fiber strength of wood poles. And now we're going to focus in on the circumference dimensions. For each pole, there's a circumference of the pole six feet from the butt and at the tip. And these dimensions appear in tables towards the back of the standard. And once again, you recall that the bending capacity is critically important in reference to the circumference and uh, because of the circumference cubed factor. So this formula is used, and this is what a typical dimension table looks like. This is Douglas fir and southern pine, which are the same because their fiber strength is the same. To point out a couple of things on this table, you notice it says approximate ground line distance from the butt. And there was a footnote added a couple of years ago because typically it seemed like everyone thought these were recommended setting depths and technically they are not. If you go down to look at the footnote, it said those were recommended embedment depths simply to define a ground line where we wanted to check for related scars and defects like straightness, not for embedment depth. So if you consider the fact that most utilities do adopt the 10% plus two feet for a setting depth, most of those are pretty close to the values you see here as well. 
but these were not set in place in order to establish the setting depth. These then were established to define any issues that occur at what would theoretically be considered the approximate ground line. Up at the top of the table are the minimum dimensions for the tip. And you notice no matter what the length of the pole is, the minimum tip dimension stays the same. And then in Annex B, it explains that these minimum circumferences specified six feet from the butt were calculated so that each species in a given class can support the class horizontal load applied two feet from the tip. So the initial requirement for wood poles is to support that horizontal load two feet from the tip. These circumference measurements then were established to make sure it exceeded that requirement. So on the one side, class loads establish the load times the distance to the ground line as what the pole has to support, and then the circumference measurements are adjusted so that combined with the fiber strength, the full bending capacity exceeds the minimum requirements of the horizontal load times the distance from the ground. Now we can show you in this close-up of an dimension table how these all play together. A 40-foot class 4 pole has a minimum circumference of 33 and a half inches and that's at 6 feet which happens to be the normal setting depth for a 40-foot pole anyhow. So if we look up top here, okay we got a class 4 pole and it's 40 feet so that's times a 32-foot moment arm 76,800 foot-pounds. That's the standard that the pole has to meet. Then we come down here and say, okay, let's apply the bending capacity formula, and it comes out at 79,401. So again, that's how those circumference measurements were established to make sure that the minimum dimension for that ground line circumference will exceed what's required to support the class load. To demonstrate again how this all works, let's look at the same size pole of two different species. 40 foot class 4 obviously comes back to that 2400 pounds, two feet from the tip. Now Douglas fir is 8000 psi and so that was the 33 and a half inches we just saw. The western red cedar in a different table says that pole has to be 36 and a half inches because of the lower fiber strength so that both poles can support that 2,400 pounds two feet from the tip. NXB, addressing ground line stresses, also has a note 7 at the bottom. And what this is dealing with is the amount of change in circumference for poles in the ground line zone. So for example, the southern pine in this table is 0.25 inches. So for every foot variation from the 6 feet you would change by 0.25 inches. And that way if you've got a pole that's set 7 feet deep and the 33 and a half was the minimum circumference, well at 7 feet it would be a quarter inch less than that. And this is just a reference table if issues come up to kind of understand. On the one hand we've got minimum circumferences at six feet, what should they be if we're looking at the pole at different lengths from the butt? So the summary of ANSIO 5.1 is that all species of the same length and class are to have similar load capacity. And this is accomplished by establishing the class loads and then determining the fiber strength of each species of wood and then adjusting circumference requirements for each species. So once again, no matter what species, if they're the same length and class, those poles will have similar load capacity. Sometimes people wonder where did these fiber strength values come from? And the first publication that showed a derivation of fiber strengths was published in 1965 by the Forest Products Lab. The document was FPL 39. So we decided as a committee we should look back and see how those were determined. And we found out that actually there were a lot of small clear samples that were used in this derivation. 
meaning that's a piece of wood that's about an inch square, about a foot long, and they test its strength and then use a series of those tests to project the strength of a larger wood pole. There were a few small full-scale tests, and but they were smaller poles in the 25, 30, maybe 35 foot range. We also noticed that the test values were adjusted in multiple different ways that we did not necessarily agree were proper. And come to find out that the intent of these fiber strengths were to have nearly 5% lower exclusion limit of actual average bending strength of three pole groups. So we looked at that and said, well, that's not exactly how we try to evaluate and determine fiber strength in poles these days. And in addition to this testing that had been done previous to 1965, additional testing took place in the 80s and it was conducted by EPRI. And here's some of that data you see for poles less than 50 feet. And here's some of the data for poles taller than 50 feet. So we took on the task of combining all of this data and adjusting it accordingly so that we were comparing apples to apples. And after an extreme amount of work and evaluation of this data, which basically the initial set of testing was conducted by ASTM and the second test was conducted, series of tests was conducted by EPRI. We came and realized that no change to the previous fiber strengths was necessary. What we benefited from this was to say, this is how we think we should derive the fiber strengths. And by going through this process, we came up with these numbers and by golly, they happened to match the previous numbers, but they accomplished it in a much different way. NXA is titled Fiber Stress Height Effect. And it was found in testing years ago that as you go up the height of a pole, the fiber strength actually decreases. So we wanted to find out as a committee, do we need to account for this in wood pole designs, especially if the maximum stress point is above ground line? So a whole variety of manufacturers participated. You can see in the southeast, northwest, and some up in the central United States. And over time, they collected dimensions while poles were being manufactured on over 22,000 poles. And this was to see, does the oversize of the pole as it grows compared to the minimum dimensions that are used in design, can that offset the reduction in fiber stress? What we found with all this data is that tips average one and a half to two classes larger than the minimum as specified. And from the testing of poles 55 feet and shorter, they usually did fail at the ground line. And so there's no fiber stress height effect that needs to be considered. Now, if you have a pole where the maximum stress point is above ground line, such as a guide pole, it was found for poles 55 feet and shorter that the oversize offsets the fiber stress height effect. So poles 55 feet and shorter do not need to consider the fiber stress height effect. For poles 60 feet and taller, number one, if the maximum stress is still at the ground line, no fiber stress height effect. If the maximum stress is above ground, there are tables in Annex A for a reduction in the fiber stress depending on the height above ground line. Mm -hmm.